So in a very different genre, we're going to get a little more technical now. Which yeah, okay. that's on. Take okay. it away. Yeah, I was going to say, I, uh, I'd like you to journey with me now from the beautiful, visual, human face of big data to the geeky, dry, and abstract face of big data. Um, how do I switch? How do I move to the next slide here? <laughs> That wasn't a joke. <laughs> I actually, there's a Bloomberg terminal in front of me, you know. Um, <laughs> Just press the button. Which one? This one. The, the enter? The, the. Very good. Thanks. Um, so, hi, I'm, I'm Kay. I'm the CEO, co founder of Mortar Data. And we started Mortar about a year ago, and we were asking ourselves the question how easy can we make Hadoop? So what we were seeing is there's this incredible technology, but for most companies, it was out of reach. So good. Uh, so the challenges that we set for ourselves included uh, how quick can we get uh, new users uh, a solution all the way to market? Because we were seeing that for a large group of users, uh, they were going to take weeks or months just to get to the point where they could understand whether Hadoop was a good fit, and then they're going to take another weeks or months uh, getting it rolled out, hiring the right people, which is a big, big problem. We wanted to make operation very easy, again, because it's hard to hire people who have Hadoop expertise, and because Hadoop is sort of famously hard to operate. We wanted to make it accessible to data scientists, and the reason for that was, well, if you've tried hiring data scientists, you know it's really hard right now, and if you tried hiring data scientists who are also fluent uh, in, in using Hadoop and big data tools, it's even harder. So some people solve that by just sitting on a pile of data and not maximizing their use of it, despite the fact they know they could be. Some people um, just hire data scientists to do their math and their algorithms, and they throw it over the wall to engineers to implement and that, you know, with predictable outcomes. Uh, and, and we really wanted people, the data scientists themselves to be able to do everything end to end. And lastly, and really importantly, we wanted our work to be loved by engineers because we felt that if engineers didn't love using Hadoop with Mortar, then there was sort of an upper limit to the complexity or sophistication and the importance of the pipelines that we would be building. So we did that by building a platform as a service to take care of operations, and we focused on making Hadoop work with Python because data scientists and engineers often use Python to, uh, to process data. So whether it's NumPy or SciPy or NLTK, these are things that are written in CPython, not in Jython, and it can be difficult to get them to work in Hadoop. So we did that. Uh, we got it working. I'm going to show you a quick screenshot. It's going to have a lot of words on it. You don't need to read the words. Uh, this, this is a screenshot. Uh, when you log into Mortar, you can actually write code immediately in your browser without installing anything. And so what that means is uh, you log in, we will start helping you write uh, code. This is pig code. It's a language you write. Um, it, it compiles into a, a MapReduce statements for a Hadoop cluster. And you can write Python, and we will handle all the operations for you when you run it. In addition to that, we can actually show you exactly what your code will do before you run it, very quickly doing smart sampling from your entire big data set so that we will explore all the edge cases in your code. So if you have a filter statement, for example, we'll make sure we get a row that filters, one that doesn't. And so this is going to be a little out of context, but here we have different steps in, um, in, a, in a Hadoop script with data flowing from step to step, and you can see what's happening along the way. So this is great for learning how to use it, and it's also really great for um, for long-term efficiency because you know exactly what your code's going to do before you fire up a big Hadoop cluster. So we're really proud of this. We think we did a great job. Our customers love it. And we're actually pretty successful, so we're able to get most data scientists productive on Hadoop in an hour. But we thought we could do a lot better than this. So before I jump into that, let me take a quick uh, uh, detour into Rails. So. For those of you that don't know, Rails is a web application framework. It's very popular. It runs some of the biggest uh, sites on the internet right now. And it's spawned all kinds of copying uh, web, web application frameworks. So if you're familiar with Django or Grails, CakePHP, a bunch of others. So in order to understand why Rails is so popular, you have to look at what existed before. So before there were web frameworks. and. Um, 
but they were they, they tended to be used very differently from one another. There was, there was a lot of different configurations. And so what that meant was every time you joined a new project, it was different. There was a ramp up curve. And it also meant that deploying was unusual. There was no standardization. Same with testing. And in addition to that, and probably even worse, there was no ecosystem where uh, people could build reusable components because everything was different. So along comes Rails, and they give you a basic development environment right out of the box. It's really easy to adopt. They uh, ask you to favor convention over configuration. So if you do things the Railsy way, you get a lot of functionality for free right out of the box. And in addition to that, your projects look like other projects, and so it's easy to ramp up and understand. And like I just said, most importantly, it, it enables a whole ecosystem of reusable components. Rails also put testing front and center, so it, you know how to and where to write tests, and that resulted in better tested and more stable um, web applications. And they were concerned with environments. So how do you move code from your local development environment to test, staging, and production? All these things come together, and it means that there's enough standardization that you can also build reusable operations. And so we see Heroku comes out of this. Heroku says, if you have a Rails application, you can push it to us. We'll scale it for you. We'll deal with your, your operations and, your, and uh, maintenance and alerts and all kinds of things. So this is huge because what we saw happen is now it reduces the cost and the time that it takes to bring something new to market. You can experiment a lot more, and it had a really big impact on innovation. So, why am I talking about Rails so much? This should be about data. There's a big parallel between the way that people developed web applications before Rails and the way that people are developing data pipelines right now. There's a lot of uh, reinvention, doing the same thing again, no testing, no standardization, no way to get uh, operations uh, off the shelf. So today we're announcing Mortar. It's, it's Rails for data pipelines. It's open source. It's in preview right now, so we're giving out invites for those of you that find this interesting to talk to me after. And when I say data pipelines, let me, let me go into that a little bit. At its simplest, there's a data source, there's some processing that happens, and there's a place where the data goes. Of course, there can be many data sources and many places where the data goes. And when I say data source and where the data goes, it could be you know, S3, it could be MySQL, it could be Mongo. Uh, it, and when it's, when it's writing out, it could be any of those things, or it could be a visualization platform, or analytics, or it could be a key value store for serving up to a, a client directly. In the middle, the processing, I'm talking about any sort of calculation. It could be simple stuff like uh, aggregation or slicing and dicing. It could be much more complicated, like doing regression, or machine learning, or linguistic analysis, or genetic analysis. When I say that what we've built is like Rails, we have designed a project structure that uh, has a place for everything. It's entirely code-based, so you can put it in Git or you can put it in Subversion. It puts test testing front and center, which is a real big deal for those of you who've worked with data. You know that having errors in your pipelines is very problematic for a business, but also very hard to do well. So we see a lot of um, you know, hopeful releases. In addition, if you use a mortar uh, uh, project structure, we know how to interpret that, and you can actually push it to us, and we'll hand, handle operations for you like Heroku does. So we'll spin up clusters. We will give you alerts. We will help you identify problems. We'll give you a history so that every time you generate data through a data pipeline, if you ever need to go back and figure, how did I, how did I generate that again? You have an exact snapshot of the code that ran it. So let me show you quickly how you would get started with Mortar. It's, it's four steps. So you install, you log in. If you have a, access to a project that is a Mortar project, you can just clone it, and then you can run it. And that's it. So we expect this to be a really big deal because it makes it so easy for people within a corporation to get on board. Or if you're trying to share code across corporations or do research, or just be, build reusable components. This is all it takes. And so, for example, if you have you know, Rick's data set in the cloud and somebody builds a mortar project that makes use of it and shows something interesting, then this is all you have to do to actually get his code, or the, the, the developer's code, get Rick's data, and run it in a consistent uh, mortar environment and reproduce it or play with it as, you would, as you'd like to do, regardless of how sophisticated that data pipeline is. So, I think I kept you to 10 minutes. Um, 
If you like what we're doing, I, as I said, we are uh, providing invitations, so talk to me after. And if you really like what we're doing, we're also hiring. Uh, <laughs> thank you. So let's do two or three questions. And actually, could you uh, state your name and, and company, if applicable, before you? My name is Carlos. I work for Lockheed Martin. I just wanted to know if it's a cross-platform or it's only on Linux. Oh, yeah, right. Thanks. <laughs> so at this, at this point, it works on Linux. It works on Mac OS. We don't have it yet working on Windows, but we'll get there. It actually, at today, is just running in the Amazon cloud, so a lot of the computation is happening off-site. Hi, Aaron Franco from ClickSlide. I'm wondering um, if it's just a channel that I push my data through, or are you storing the data that comes in as well? We don't actually store the data. We use the data that's already stored in the cloud. So if you have, for example, data in S3, or you have a Mongo instance in the cloud, we can, we can pull from that. Yeah, but you pull, and then you just push back and you delete what it's on. Sorry, sorry about that. You, you pull, and then you run the processes, and you push the data back to where it was. But when, as that data comes through your system, are you caching that in memory or storing that anywhere? So it gets stored on a Hadoop cluster for the period of time the Hadoop cluster exists, and then it's ephemeral, so we shut it down, and it goes to wherever it's going, and it's gone. So um, I saw there that in your, your job run line, you said like dash dash cluster size equals 20. Is that, is that assuming the presence of an EC2 interface or something that'll spin up VMs? So yeah, we, we manage that. So we create the, the VMs. All right. So one of Hadoop's uh, philosophies is that you take the computation to the data rather than moving the data to the computation. But it sounds to me what you've just described there is you're going out pulling this data into a Hadoop cluster, running a job on it, and then you drop the data. So then if I want to do another computation on the same data, I have to do that same pull back in. And that's actually, for a very large data sets, it's going to be a very expensive operation. Yeah, so if you've got very large data sets and you know you need to do more than one single operation, you can leave the cluster in place. It doesn't have to go up and down immediately. Hi, Aaron Franco, ClickSlide again. <laughs> um, so yeah, that pushing data out of out of one of my instances or multiple a cluster of instances into instances on your data center um, is an expensive operation for bandwidth as well. Right. So if the data isn't already in the same data center, so in the same um, region in, in Amazon, for example, then yeah, that would be very slow. It's probably not something you want to do. So we actually run our cloud service where the data is. So you would install your system into my data cluster and then? Not into your data cluster, but to the same data center as where you are physically Okay, located. right, so like East One or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Right, exactly. Thanks. Okay, cool, great. Um, yep, Kay okay, will be uh, staying with us afterwards as well, so if you have more questions, uh, please find him after the event. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank well you. done.